What is up my friends? My name is Kim and if you like true crime like I do, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I hope everyone is having a fabulous day today. Today is a bonus video. This is my third video this week. Usually I only post two, but this week I really wanted to get this case out. Today I am drinking some ginger peach tea. I noticed that the tea really helps because with these videos they can get kind of long and all the talking and for whatever reason this just wets my whistle so <laughs> I've been including uh, some tea in my uh, in my videos. So I had this request through my Instagram for this case that I'm going to cover today and after I looked it up I was completely baffled. It was actually a, a documentary and it's on Hulu and it's called The State Versus Melissa and it's about Melissa Lucio and she is the first Hispanic woman put on death row in Texas. Melissa was put on death row for killing her two-year-old daughter. Melissa killed her daughter in the way that the forensic pathologist said was the worst case of child abuse she has seen in 30 years. I want to talk about the documentary and what the documentary didn't tell you. Let's get into it now. This case starts at 7 p.m. on Saturday, February 17th, 2007. Paramedics were dispatched to an apartment where Melissa Lucio lived with her nine children. At the time, she had 12 children total and she was pregnant with twins. So you can just imagine this is a house full of lots of kids. Could you imagine? I could not imagine that many kids. One of the paramedics that arrived on the scene testified when they entered the apartment, they found that Mariah, the daughter of Melissa that had passed away, she was unattended and lying on her back in the middle of the floor, not breathing with no pulse. The paramedic observed Melissa was distant and was not overly distressed. Her behavior was in his description so far out of the ordinary and he put that in his report about Melissa. This paramedic would also testify that he noted the fact that Melissa was not even within arm's reach of the child, more or less trying to hold her or trying any basic help for her. Basically, Melissa was distant between her and poor little Mariah, not doing anything to help her, not grieving, not holding her hand, she was just off on the sideline. Melissa had nine children and what she called her husband, and they just moved in to a apartment that looked like it was either a one or a two bedroom home. The pictures I saw looked like it was only one bedroom, but I could not confirm that. So it could be a two bedroom, but I'm just not positive. So that's 11 people. I would think, I mean, even if we say it's a three bedroom, 11 people, I would imagine that you couldn't even fart without someone in the house calling you out for it. You're basically on top of each other. And needless to say, there would be absolutely no privacy. So now that we know how the case starts, let's talk about the documentary. The older son states that they had just moved into this apartment, so his mom, Melissa, was bit busy, you know, putting things away, she was cleaning, and he was holding Mariah, the two-year-old, and she looked to him like she was tired. So he made a comment to her and said, oh, you're so sleepy and that he kissed her on her forehead and she went to sleep. Mariah would never wake up. So the documentary starts immediately with you being smacked in the face with a woman, Melissa, demonstrating on how she used to spank Mariah on a like a child's baby doll. So she's just doing these whops on a baby doll. This is at the police station and she is being interrogated by the investigators. It's really hard to watch. And at this point, I thought, 
I should just turn this off. I don't know if this is the show for me, but actually it does kind of soften from there. It like goes in really hard and it kind of weakens a little bit from there as far as uh, you know, that type of image. The police um, had been questioning her for hours, showing her pictures of Mariah's bruised and beaten body, asking her to explain how she looks the way that she does. You guys, these pictures they show in the documentary, I won't show them, of course, but it is heartbreaking. Her body is literally bruised from head to toe. I don't I don't mean like a bruise on her face, a bruise on her arm, a bruise on her leg. No. There are several bruises, several bruises. Her poor little body was literally covered. It was as if she was a human punching bag for somebody. Stay with me you guys. This is the the tough part. It's it's important to understand the case and these types, the type of trauma that poor little Mariah went through, it's hard to talk about. And I believe that is why this case has not been covered as much as it probably should. I, I see no news reports. I see no YouTube videos. Honestly, if this Melissa versus, or state of Texas versus Melissa never came out, I probably would have never heard of this case. And this woman is on death row. Like serial killers are on death row. Like she must have did something big time, but it is not talked about. And that was really surprising to me. But it's, it's a story that you've heard time and time again and it's horrific. This is a mother who is designed by nature to take care of children. And so when you hear something like this and how traumatic it is on top of it, it almost becomes distasteful and people don't want to talk about it. And I get it. But it's important. So as I seen the bruises in the show, my instant thought was post-mortem bruising. It must be that. I mean, it couldn't be that she's literally littered in bruises like that. That just doesn't happen. Well, no, it wasn't. This, these pictures were taken immediately after she was found, when she was taken to the hospital and medical examiner took pictures of her. So this wasn't long like hours after to be able because you do get that discoloration whatever so that was my initial thought but that was not the case at all they went on to explain that her arm had been broken and had not been treated it was in a healing stage but it had been broken and it had not sought treatment she had several bite marks on her back not just one but it looked like she had three separate different bite marks on her back in different healing patterns she had patches of missing hair as if it had been pulled out it was the worst case of child abuse the pathologist had seen in 30 years there were bruises on the face, in the hair, on the chest. This was the worst case of child abuse I had ever seen. Just think about that. That's all she does. And it was the worst case she's seen. In addition to the documentary um, described, Mariah had what appeared to be pinch marks on her vaginal area. Now that was not talked about during the documentary. Actually, a lot of things weren't talked about in the documentary. The documentary, the documentary is designed to be entertainment and they do portray a story and they did end it with the statement that this was from Melissa's point of view. So you have to take that in account that it was for entertainment and and like I had mentioned earlier, if it gets too horrific, then you want to turn it off. So they softened it definitely, but it was horrific. So they, 
they left out the part that she had pinches to her vagina area but however in the documentary what they did include is they asked the other children because there was eight other children in the home they asked them to explain how their mom would punish would punish them and she would say or it was a girl that was talking but she said uh that her mother would occasionally pinch her. So this is consistent with Mariah's injuries. So this wasn't out of character for Melissa to pinch her children. The placement, however, is very different. Now there was no mention anywhere of sexual abuse, okay? So we'll just get that out of the way. I believe pinches to the vagina area is sexual abuse, but uh, you know, there, there's no mention of it. There was no charges brought against her for it. So, I mean, she had bigger fish to fry. I don't know if they didn't include it because of that or if it just, it just didn't happen. I don't know. So in addition, Mariah had a few other issues as well. She had contusions to her lungs and kidneys caused by either punches or stomps. She had dehydration bruises over an extensive area of her body and blunt force trauma to the head which is believed to be the cause of her brain bleed and her death. In the documentary they show Melissa admitting to spanking and punishing Mariah but they have an expert explain that it had been hours of interrogation. She didn't have any food, she didn't have any water, that there were even times where they think that maybe she didn't even have a bathroom break. While Melissa was in this interrogation, she isn't seen screaming, she isn't seen crying, she isn't at any point showing, in my opinion, any grief for the loss of her daughter. At one point, she is shown with her head on the table, actually sleeping. In her defense, it, it was three o'clock in the morning. She had just lost her daughter, but it just seemed like an odd behavior. That's just in my opinion. Melissa's defense and in the documentary, they want to paint a picture that the in the interrogation that because of the circumstances that it shouldn't be allowed to be shown to the jury. That Melissa was put in, in this strenuous situation, so that's why she's confessing to spanking Mariah. But what they don't tell you is that she continues to admit that she spanked and abused Mariah well after the interrogation. This was actually part of her defense. I pulled up the appeal and this is coming right from Melissa's defense attorney. This is the quote right from her lawyer's mouth and this is the opening remarks. Quote, my client is not up for mother of the year. I told you that my client is guilty of injury to a child. She is and she has admitted that. The question here before you is whether or not on February 17, 2007, Melissa Lucio intentionally and knowingly killed Mariah Alvarez. That's the issue. That's the issue. Not whether she beat her, not whether she broke her arm, not whether she's a lousy mother or didn't provide for her children. That's not the issue. The issue is whether or not she killed Mariah on the 17th of February 2007 unquote so as you can hear her defense is not stating that Melissa didn't abuse Mariah that her interrogation was was something that she was coerced to say because she said these words after her interrogation and as we know she didn't take her to seek medical treatment either Melissa stated she could tell Mariah was sick that day she wouldn't eat and she would have bouts of tremors and twitch. Melissa did not seek help for her daughter. What Mariah went through was a slow process of death. Melissa had endless time to get her help, but did nothing. The documentary touched on the fact that Melissa was addicted to drugs. 
She admitted it. She was described by her family in the documentary that she would go in the bathroom for hours getting high. Her kids would say, yeah, she was addicted to drugs, but that she was a good mom. Could you imagine being absent for a couple hours with nine kids running around your house? You can't, it just, no. What is important here is that they found drug paraphernalia in the home when they called for help for Mariah, as well as two-year-old Mariah had cocaine in her system. How does that happen? Please someone tell me. My first thought, and I have no idea, but possibly Mariah was in pain from her injuries, and she was described in the documentary as being a child that cried a lot, and that possibly Melissa gave her some of that just to ease her pain, but that, that could be far-fetched, I don't know. My second opinion is that she was two years old and most two-year-olds cannot keep their hands out of their mouth. So possibly she was reaching around, got her hands on it, put it in her mouth, and that's possibly how she got it in her system. But she's two years old with cocaine in her system. So this obviously was a point of contention for me, but it really didn't come up too much in the documentary or in her court documents. Okay, so we should back up a little bit. Who is Melissa Lucio and her backstory? Melissa was born on July 18th, 1968. She had two sisters and a brother. Her and her family were living in Rio Grande Valley at the time of her arrest. She grew up in an absent father home and she alleged that she was sexually assaulted by her mother's live-in boyfriend but we'll talk about that more. She got married at the age of 16 years old. She married a man who was an alcoholic. He was also very abusive to Melissa. She would go on to explain that she got married because she wanted to get out of the home where she was being abused. Melissa stated that she had five kids by the age of 24 years old. Yikes. Melissa's husband's sister, which would be her sister-in-law, allegedly introduced her for the first time to drugs, and that's when Melissa got addicted to drugs. So about the sexual assault Melissa claimed happened to her from her mom's live-in boyfriend. She stated it, it started when she was around seven years old, and it lasted for a couple of years. The prosecutor stated that she brought this into play long after she had already seen doctors. And when she seen these first doctors, she said, no, I've never been sexually assaulted. But as it got further into the legal process, that she conveniently brought this up to help her in her defense. When she was asked earlier, she would say that she hadn't been abused in that way but then she changed her tune later for her defense, and that's the only reason why she later con said that this happened. I have no doubt that she was probably abused. Her mother in the documentary stated that poor little seven-year-old Melissa came up to her and told her sh she was being abused. And her mother responds with, oh my God, I can't believe this, this MF, and I'm gonna get him out. No, her mother does not do that. Her mother tells her to never say that again because it wasn't true. Her mom said that she didn't believe her because she was so little. What the actual fuck? The defense stated that Melissa didn't develop this information earlier because she suppressed the information. Melissa dealt with her problems by bearing them. All of her traumas, she liked to pretend like they never happened. In my opinion, I do believe that this is a character flaw of Melissa. This would explain a lot about her interrogation as well as her defense. Her defense lawyer stated that she just really didn't seem to care, like it was just going to magically disappear and everything was going to be okay. He would state that it was very difficult and hard to defend somebody who didn't seem to be interested in defending themselves. I mean, could you imagine you have somebody that says, I'm innocent, I didn't do this, I didn't intentionally hurt my daughter, but then just kind of stand back aloof 
and not do anything to help protect her, it makes it very hard for another person to invest. Now, a good lawyer, in my opinion, would overlook that and do the best that they could, but in this case, he said it was very hard to defend her. So as you can imagine, just by that statement, the defense lawyer was under extreme fire in this documentary. The prosecutor was, was actually put in jail because he was taking bribes. It was portrayed as if the prosecutor and the defense lawyer, her defense lawyer, were in cahoots. Her defense lawyer ends up going over to the other side, to the prosecutor side, after her case or shortly after her case was over. It was described in the documentary with evidence that Melissa's lawyer left out key information to adequately defend her. The defense lawyer did not call any of your family. He didn't call any of her friends as character witnesses. Um, there was allegations that one of the daughters, Alex, she was an older daughter, that she was the one that was abusing Mariah and that she was the one that pushed this poor baby down some stairs. Melissa stated in the documentary that she believes it could have been Alex, that she believed it could have been Alex, but she was taking the blame earlier. When she first got arrested, she was taking the blame for Alex. She didn't want Alex to get in trouble at the time, but that totally contradicts what she is saying today. Why do you not want to protect your daughter Alex now? I lied to protect her, but now I don't want to lie anymore? I'm not buying it. No. Do I think Alex could have played a part in hurting Mariah? Yeah, I do. The amount of injuries and the admitted abuse from Melissa, this would have been acceptable in this home. They lived on top of each other, one person after another. They had one mattress. So basically it's monkey see, monkey do. If mom's doing it, I can do it. Because they would punish these kids. Mom was absent. She was off doing drugs. The little ones were left with the older ones and they're left to discipline her. And she was a crying kid. She probably did abuse her. Was she the cause of her dying though? That's the question. Now they in introduce child protective services into the documentary. They state that there is between two to 4,000 pages of CPS documents involving Melissa and her children. They state that there was not a history of physical abuse. Of all those pages, there is not any physical abuse. And that's important to understand because she didn't have a history of violence. She's never been arrested for violence. She just was never described as a violent person, that of those thousands of pages, it was only neglect. What they didn't say in the documentary, that Mariah was removed from the home when she was only two, two weeks old. She was only two weeks old. That Mariah was in foster care after her birth until 88 days before her death. 88 days, y'all. So that's three months in Melissa's care to the end of her life. Alex, the older daughter, the one that now Melissa is saying, I don't wanna protect her anymore, whatever, that possibly pushed her down the stairs, admits in the documentary that she didn't really have a, bl a bond with Mariah because she was from a different father from her. But in the appeal I read, Melissa would say those same words that because Mariah was removed from the home when she was only weeks old after her birth, that she too didn't feel a bond with Mariah. So in the documentary, they explain that it was neglect that caused the reports and actions from CPS. Let me tell you what neglect looks like. Because when I hear neglect in my innocent brain, I'm thinking that you know, they're running around the streets, that they probably haven't had a shower, or, you know, they're probably not being fed. But let me, let me tell you the reason that the kids were removed. And this is directly from the appeal, and I'll link this all below so you guys can check it out yourself. Proceed with caution. This is from the CPS worker herself. Quote, 
On September 21st, 2004, I made a second home visit at the residence to address the allegations on the second report. At this time, the home was found to be unsafe for the children. Ants were seen crawling on the floor and a mattress where the newborn baby Mariah was sleeping. There was a fan in the window with no cover, leaving the blades exposed. Inside the refrigerator, there was a rotten head of lettuce, a carton of eggs, and a plastic container of mayonnaise. The refrigerator had an odor of spoiled food. The pantry contained one small can of corn, a box of salt, sauce, a box of infant mixed cereal, and empty condiment containers. There was a strong odor of urine throughout the home. I made contact with Robert, Gabriel, Adriana, Sarah, and Mariah Alvarez at their residence. Robert, four years old, was observed with a dime-sized bruise on his stomach, an old scratch on his stomach that was about three inches long, and insect bites on his arms and legs. He was observed to have two staples on his head, reportedly from an injury he sustained from falling off the bed. Gabriel, three years old, was observed with bite marks the size of two quarters on his left shoulder, multiple scratches on his face, and multiple insect bites on his arms and legs. Adriana, two years old, was observed with one inch linear scab on the top of her head and multiple insect bites on her back, arms, and legs. Her body was very dirty with dried feces on her genital area. Sarah, only one years old, was observed to have a half inch cold sore on the bottom of her lip and multiple insect bites on her arms and legs and body. She also had an open circular mark on the right side of her leg that appeared to be infected with pus. Sarah, again, only one years old, was observed to be wearing neither underwear nor a diaper. Her body was very dirty with dried feces on her genital area. Mariah was observed to have tremors every once in a while. She was also observed to have a small light green bruise on her right foot. No other visible marks were seen. At the time, Mariah was only two weeks old, so just keep that in mind. All of the children appeared as if they had not been bathed. Their hair appeared to be matted and dirty. Their bodies appeared to be dirty with all of the children, and all of them had a strong body odor. I made contact with Melissa Lucio. A drug test was administered at the time. Ms. Lucio tested positive for cocaine, but continued to deny that she was doing drugs. According to Ms. Lucio, her husband, Robert Alvarez, was going to get some groceries sometime that day. She stated that sometimes the family went to a place called Loaves and Fishes, which was a soup kitchen, because she gets tired of cooking. Ms. Lucio admitted she had previous CPS history involving drug use and stated that she participated in services through the department. Ms. Lucio indicated that she did not have any family members who could take care of the children. She stated that the father to her older children resided in Houston, Texas, and that he would be willing to take responsibility for them. Ms. Lucio stated that Roberto Alvarez, father to the seven younger children, worked late and could not make contact with the worker. Mr. Alvarez has never made contact with the worker to that time. Ms. Lucio was not able to provide the worker with a visible placement for the children, unquote. So at this time, the children were removed from the home. They went into foster care. But CPS would return Mariah plus the other eight children to the home on November 21st, 2006. Melissa told the police during her recorded statement that she was not close to Mariah because CPS removed Mariah from the home when she was only three weeks old. So as you can imagine, that is pretty damning information, okay? So it's very eye-opening. So there is a, a lot of issues going on there. And mind you, this is just statements from one of the CPS cases. 
and that's why they were removed. There are so many other examples and yeah, she she was a bad mom and that is the understatement of the year. At one point, she, her and our children went to live in a park. They were homeless for almost six weeks in a park they were living, her and her children. The documentary focused on the lawyer and the lawyer seemed to do pretty much a lousy job protecting Melissa. It, it just cannot be denied, in my opinion. I think he was just sick of representing the bad guy by this point, probably was interviewing for this prosecutor's office job. He was looking forward to the day where he didn't have to protect the bad people anymore. I don't know this, I'm guessing, but that was what was going on at the time because he ended up going over to the prosecutor's office and that doesn't happen overnight. But that being said, yes, she had a bad defense, but she's had multiple appeals, all of them denied. Melissa has been appealing for 11 years. Her incarceration report while she's been locked up isn't pleasant as well. She has been said to fight with other inmates plus the guards. Not exactly the non-violent person that the documentary leads you to believe, in my opinion. So what happened was in July of 2019, people were coming forward. Her story was becoming known. In July of 2019, they reversed her conviction because they said she had a bad defense in layman's terms. Well, that was false hope for Melissa because when the state appealed it in February 2021, the same court reversed her conviction. The court nullified her reversal and reinstated her death sentence. Now it is up to the US Supreme Court if they refuse to look at it, her death date will be set. And that's where it stands today. And that is actually the closing credits of the documentary. If you guys wanna check out the documentary, it's on Hulu or you can find it on YouTube and you can, you can purchase it that way. My thoughts of the documentary is I find it, it was really interesting. And when I got done watching it, I honestly wanted to call the innocence project for melissa i i felt that moved by it it did its job but now that i've done the research into it i know for a fact that melissa is where she needs to be they painted a picture of somebody who potentially could be innocent but they left a lot of facts out Again, it was from Melissa's point of view. It did say it did say that in the documentary. So, you know, I can't blame them. I was entertained by it, but me being someone that has access to the internet, I was able to look it up and I lost all empathy for Melissa. What happened to Mariah is unimaginable. And it only happened in a 3-month period. Her actions are reprehensible, and she should never, ever be in the presence of children. Her children, anybody else's children, she is right where she needs to be. I don't know what turned that switch for Melissa to become a violent person, but she did, and it escalated fast. As far as her death sentence, I'm a bit torn on that one. I 100% percent believe that she should spend the rest of her life in prison. She is guilty of letting her daughter die, be abused, that ended in death, or herself abused her, causing death. And she took no measures to help her from dying. Without a doubt in my mind, she is definitely guilty. But was it premeditated capital murder? I'm just not sure on that one. But let me know what you guys think. Life in prison, death, or maybe you think something totally, totally different. This was a tough case that ended in a horrific death of an innocent two-year-old baby girl. Rest in peace, Mariah, and prayers to the family. There's a lot of them. Uh, one of her daughters ended up having nine children because she wanted to have a big family like her mom. Interesting. I don't know how one could take care of nine kids, but that's just me. If you guys made it to the end, you guys are rock stars and I love you to death. 
There are more true crime videos in my Captured Killers playlist if you want to check them out. But either way, thanks so much for watching, my loves. Stay safe, and I'll see you in my next one. Bye.